The year is 1999. It's Saturday during summer break, and you woke up early to enjoy watching new episodes of Digimon, Power Rangers in Space, and of course Pokemon, while having some delicious Cinnamon Toast Crunch. After, you're in the middle of an intense session of Star Fox 64, when you hear the phone ring in the other room. Your mom or dad yells for you that your friend is on the phone. Excited at the possibility of hanging out, you run to the phone to see what's up. It's then that your friend tells you excitedly that they went to the Pokemon League. What? Pokemon League? They then proceed to tell you that their mom took them to Toys R Us for a trading card game event, and they have something they want to show you, but won't tell you what it is over the phone. You ask your parents if you can go to your friend's house, and after the usual questions if your room is clean and chores are all done, and the anxiousness of them delaying their answer, they finally say yes and agree to drive you over. Your friend greets you and excitedly leads you to their room, only to show you they earned a badge. The Boulder Badge, a real gym badge. And not only that, they got a card too. An interesting looking Pikachu with a stamp that reads promo in a black star. You're amazed, a bit jealous, and have a million questions. When, where, how? Your friend explains everything and asks if you want to go with him next week. And from there, the rest is history. Earning badges, occasionally getting a promo card, and expanding your knowledge of all things Pokemon with your best friend, you continue going as often as you can each week with the hopes of getting a new badge and possibly even a new promo card. Eventually, through your obsession with Pokemon, you'd find promo cards appearing in other places as well, from going to see the first movie in theaters to getting an issue of Nintendo Power. Any time you'd get a new Pokemon card when you least expected it was a feeling unlike any other as a kid. It's like getting a cereal box prize. Sure, it's not the most exciting toy in the world, but sometimes they're just entertaining enough to really make your day. Tonight, we're going to discuss all 53 of the original Wizards of the Coast Pokemon promo cards and how they were obtained. This video is going to be a bit on the shorter side than my usual offerings, but should still be binge-worthy, so grab a snack, get comfy. This is going to be a sort of long video. Let's get started. This card, as mentioned in the story during the intro, was the very first Wizards of the Coast promo card released, and was given out for free to anyone who participated in the Pokemon League during July of 1999, while supplies last. This card's artwork was done by Keiji Kinabuchi, who did many other Pokemon cards, oftentimes in a 3D-esque style, such as Fossil Set's Haunter, Gengar, and Ditto, and Base Set's Staryu, among others. Given the leafy Ivy design in the background, this card is often referred to as Ivy Pikachu. Changing gears for a second, since it's going to be a recurring source of these promo cards, I'll do my best to give a description of the official Pokemon trading card game League and what it was all about, but to be honest, the information behind the event in general is quite vague looking back. From what I personally remember when going, you could play against other participants, but in order to win a gym badge, you must play against a designated gym leader that was often an employee of the store. I assume these gym leaders were taught in full how to play the game, as of course it was necessary in order to give out the badges, but I'm not entirely sure how they went about using a deck. I'm not sure if they were using pre-builds or if they were knowledgeable enough to make their own. I have no idea, so if anyone has any information in regards to this, comment below, as there's really no information anywhere online that I could find. Anyway, as I had mentioned, Toys R Us was the store that generally held the event, however, I've heard that the Pokemon Leagues were also held at designated card and hobby shops and Wizards of the Coast stores. I've never personally known any mom and pop style card shops holding this event officially, but I have seen others discussing it online, so I don't doubt it. And really, that would be it for this card. However, this card also harbors quite an interesting mystery. A mystery that is still debated to this day. From what I've gathered in my research, a version of this card, with not only the promo stamp, but a first edition stamp as well, supposedly was put in booster packs of the first edition jungle set. Rumors state that this card's rarity is somewhere in the ballpark of 1 in 10 booster boxes. Not packs, boxes. That's 1 in 360 packs, so it's no wonder that this card maintains an enigmatic aura to this day. A video of someone pulling this card in a jungle first edition booster box does exist on YouTube, lending evidence towards this being the case, 
as well as Pro Boards forums, posts from 2020 discussing the card, and evidence of it being promoted as a chase card in Japan. Based off the form, it appears that English cards were actually quite popular in Japan, so they'd still be sold alongside their Japanese counterparts in card shops. So the question comes down to whether or not any of these first edition Ivy Pikachu promos were in booster boxes that were imported from Japan, or just a select few first edition boxes regardless of location, or who knows, apparently there's one other way these cards got into circulation. An upcoming promo card that we'll be discussing involved mailing a fan-made card idea of a baby Pokemon to Wizards of the Coast, and in return, simply for participating, Wizards of the Coast would mail the sender this upcoming card. On a website called Pokemon.com, I came across an interview in which one participant of this contest had their card chosen, and was sent 10 first edition Ivy Pikachu promo cards as a prize. Though, from what I've read, there was no winning in this contest. It was simply Wizards of the Coast choosing a few of their favorite cards they received from this event, and nothing really more to it. In the end, that was really all the information I was able to find in regards to this strange case of a card, so keep an eye out, this mystery is still wide open. Promo cards 2 through 5, being Electabuzz, Mewtwo, Pikachu, and Dragonite, were given out with the purchase of a ticket to the theatrical release of Mewtwo Strikes Back. Electabuzz, Mewtwo, and Pikachu feature artwork by Ken Sugimori, and Dragonite features artwork from Toshino Aoki in his signature cartoonish style. So yeah, simply put, buy a ticket to the movie and get a free card. I personally remember going to see the movie with my parents and my sister. My parents of course gave me their cards, as did my sister, since they didn't really care. I got Pikachu, Mewtwo, and if I'm remembering correctly, two Electabuzzes, and luckily I was able to find someone in line to trade for Dragonite to complete the set. That was the thing about Pokemon back in the day, it was truly an experience unlike any other time. Pokemon may have maintained popularity and still be a thing today, but back then, you could go up to any kid your age, and odds are, they had Pokemon cards, or the Game Boy games on them, and you could trade. Not everyone had a link cable, of course, but if you were a nerd like me, you brought it with you everywhere. I remember one time going to Ikea with my parents and trading a kid for his Kabuto. Pokemon's peak was something that I don't think can ever be replicated again, though Pokemon Go's release did come pretty close. Promo card number 6 is Arcanine, yet another card given out during the Pokemon League. This one was given out to participants during March of 2000. The artwork for this card was once again by Ken Sugimori, and features his iconic style that I absolutely love. Not a whole lot to really say about this one though, so on to the next. Promo number 7 is Jigglypuff, with artwork provided by Keiji Kinabuchi, with his signature 3D style. This card was obtained via a mail-away campaign with the Pokemon the First Movie soundtrack. CD and cassette copies of the soundtrack included details of a mail-away campaign requiring people to send their proof of purchases in exchange for the card. I remember bugging my mom constantly about getting this out into the mail and remembering it taking months to arrive, but it finally did. The first movie soundtrack, though, is... well, it's not horrible. I'm not a huge fan of the movie version of the theme song. Don't Say You Love Me by M2M is nostalgic, and I love it. Britney Spears' Soda Pop, Somewhere Someday by NSYNC, Get Happy by Bewitched is on there, and Bewitched is one of my pop influences when it comes to writing music. So this soundtrack just reeks of the 90s, and none of the songs are even in the movie, save for like, Vacation, being in Pikachu's Vacation. It's really just a collection of songs that you can make a Pokemon AMV to, I guess. Oh yeah, and Catch Me If You Can, which has an awesome version in Pokemon Puzzle League on the Nintendo 64, which is just one of the best 64 games of all time, and sorry, I'm totally getting sidetracked. Let's get back on to the promo cards. Promo number 8, we've got Mew, a very exciting card when it first came out. Artwork for this card was once again provided by Ken Sugimori. I remember everyone being very excited for a Mew card, as just like in the games, Mew always seemed to be just completely unobtainable. That would change, of course, in January of 2000, when this card would be the free card given out to participants of the Pokemon League. Strangely enough, promo number 6 Arcanine that I previously mentioned was released in March of 2000, but Mew here, promo number 8, came out in January of 2000, so 
As you can see, the dates these cards were released weren't quite lining up with the card's promo numbers. Furthermore, I'm not sure if anyone else had this experience, but when I was a kid, after this card came out, suddenly everyone had it, and not just one, people had stacks of this card, and I have no idea how. I even recall having at least four or five of them on my own, and I don't even know where they came from. It was ridiculous. Even on eBay to this day, you can still find people selling this card in massive quantities. Like, maybe they just printed a bunch of them to keep up with the demand for such a popular Pokemon. I don't know, but it's everywhere. Promo number 9, we've once again got Mew, only this time it's a holographic version, and one of my favorite early holographic cards just due to the vibrance. The artwork is of course still Ken Sugimori, and unlike the last Mew card that everyone had a bunch of, not as many people had this one in their collections which kind of made it a standout card to have. This card was given out at the Pokemon League in April of 2000. Promo number 10, we've got Meowth, and is the second holographic promo card. I didn't mention this with Mew, as it kind of goes without saying, but any time you got a holographic card, it was a time of complete celebration and hype, and getting them from such special sources as the promo cards were distributed always felt really special, and this card's artwork is unique and very eye-catching. The artwork for this card was done by Kagemaru Himeno, who has done artwork for a bunch of books and manga, as well as countless Pokemon cards starting from Jungle Set to this day, including Fossil Set's Aerodactyl, Cloyster, Ekans, and Dragonite, Jungle Set's Butterfree, Executor, and one of my personal favorite cards of all time, Flareon, and the list goes on. She's really done a lot of cards and has a very vibrant and colorful style. You could obtain this Meowth card by purchasing the Pokemon trading card game for Game Boy Color. Luckily, this time you didn't have to mail away any proof of purchases, as the card was conveniently packaged right inside the game's box. For promo card number 11, we've got Eevee, and is the third holographic promo card, and is another colorful and very vibrant addition to the set. Which of course means that this card, too, was illustrated by Kagemaru Himeno. I don't know how she does it, but I just love her style, I absolutely adore it. This card was given out at the Pokemon League in June of 2000, which is really awesome. Sure, getting the holographic Mew was nice from the Pokemon League, but it was a copy of a card that we already had. Getting a holographic card from the Pokemon League that was a unique new Pokemon, that was a whole other level, especially because it was Eevee, who, like today, was always a very popular Pokemon. Promo number 12 is Mewtwo, and was illustrated by Christopher Rush, a very famous illustrator responsible for many cards in Wizards of the Coast's other popular trading card game, Magic the Gathering, including such famous cards as Lightning Bolt and the legendary Black Lotus. I can't really find any information on the circumstances in which this card could have been made. I mean, of course Rush worked for Wizards of the Coast, and they could have just asked him to do the artwork, but... I'm just curious as to how it all went down. I guess it doesn't really matter anyway. The card was given out for free in the April 2000 issue of Nintendo Power. If you had a subscription to Nintendo Power and were already stoked to see a new issue in your mailbox, just imagine how absolutely elated you'd be to find a new Pokemon card in there as well. And not just any Pokemon, Mewtwo, one of the most popular and coolest Pokemon of all time. Everyone loved Mewtwo back then, and thought he was the most edgy, awesome Pokemon. I even had a shirt with Mewtwo on it that I love to wear just because I thought Mewtwo was so cool. Having a Mewtwo card in your folder instantly made you the coolest kid in the room, and this special Mewtwo card was certain to make your collection something special. Promo card number 13 is Venusaur, and features artwork once again by Ken Sugimori. This gorgeous card was given out as a pack-in bonus with the Pokemon trading card game Nintendo Player's Guide, which explains why I knew no one who owned this card. Barely anyone I knew even had the Game Boy game, and there's no reason to buy a strategy guide to a game you didn't own. I'm sure my experience is shared by many. I knew one person who had that Meowth card, but no one had this Venusaur card. Looking back, it's definitely easy to see that if you were the kid who had this card in your folder, you were definitely given some props. Promo number 14 is yet another Mewtwo card, with artwork by Benimaru Ito, 
who has quite a history with Nintendo, working as a character designer for Earthbound, assisting in development of Super Smash Bros. 64 and Melee, and doing assisting on multiple Kirby titles. He also illustrated the Star Fox and Metroid comics featured in Nintendo Power Magazine, as well as other published Pokemon products. This Mewtwo, apart from the artwork, is actually an exact copy of Promo 3 Mewtwo from the first movie set. Not really sure why it doesn't have unique attacks and all that, but it's still a cool card regardless. This card was obtained by purchasing a VHS or DVD copy of Pokemon the first movie. Unlike Jigglypuff where you had to mail away for your card, this one was packed in, so buy the movie, get the card. Promo number 15 is Cool Porygon, and he's very cool indeed. Artwork for this card was provided by Hiromichi Sugiyama, who despite not doing as many cards as some of the other illustrators, definitely has his own style that's very unique, often featuring a very 3D-esque look. This card, similarly to Promo 13 Venusaur, was very uncommon, as the way to obtain it was by purchasing the Nintendo 64 Pokemon Stadium Battle Set Bundle. By the time Pokemon Stadium was released in North America in February of 2000, most people who wanted a Nintendo 64 already had one, so this bundle was at the very least uncommon, which makes my boy Porygon's card even more elusive. And you know what? I'm sure that this was an attempt to slander Porygon's good name. Nintendo, I am telling you again, Porygon is innocent. You will stop this slanderous hate for my boy. He will be silenced no more. I will not rest until Porygon is the featured Pokemon in his own game, gets an entire episode dedicated to him, and becomes Ash's new partner in the anime. What are you afraid of, Nintendo? What are you afraid of? Like, comment, and subscribe. Promo card number 16 is Computer Error, and it's also an enormous disappointment. I joke partially, but when you're a kid and you get a Pokemon card, you want it to be a Pokemon. Most kids I knew who collected cards put all their trainers in the back of their binders, if they even put them in there at all. Some kids I knew just saw them as a waste of space and left them out, along with the energies. The only trainers I ever saw that got love were the Gym Leader cards that were released in Gym Heroes and Gym Challenge. But anyway, artwork for this card was provided by Sumiyoshi Kazuki, who has provided many cards over the years, starting with the Rocket set and continuing to this day having a Fletchling card in the most recent set, Chilling Rain. This card was given out at the Pokemon League in May of 2000. Promo card number 17, we've got Dark Persian, and this card is another home run. With another card featuring the fantastic artwork of Ken Sugimori and being holographic, this was another total head-turner for your collection. To obtain this card, you needed to have a subscription to Nintendo Power and receive the August 2000 issue, number 135. From my research, you had to receive the issue in the mail. Buying it in stores did not include the card as a pack-in bonus, so that made it quite a bit less common to come across. Promo number 18 is Team Rocket's Meowth, and features artwork by Kunihiko Yuyama, who has done only one other card for the trading card game, that being a Japanese-only Arceus, Arceus card. You guys know I can't pronounce anything. Why do I even try? He has been the executive director of six seasons of the anime, as well as the director and storyboarder for eight of the Pokemon movies. Pretty awesome that he was able to do a couple cards. I used to always think this card's art was kind of weird, and I mean, I still kind of do, but knowing more about the illustrator definitely gives me more appreciation for it. This card was given out at the Pokemon League during August of 2000. Promo number 19 is Sabrina's Abra, and features artwork by Atsuko Nishida, who has a very important role with Game Freak and the history of Pokemon as a whole. As a matter of fact, Atsuko is the one who designed Pikachu, as well as the Charmander line including Charizard, Bulbasaur, Squirtle and Wartortle, Raichu, Alolan Raichu, Mincino and Cincino, Espeon, Umbreon, Letheon, Glaceon, and Sylveon, among many others. So. Her importance to the franchise absolutely cannot be understated. Similarly to the Dark Persian promo, this card was also given out in an issue of Nintendo Power, this time being the October 2000 issue, number 137. Once again, it seems you had to have 
been a subscriber to get the card, and it wasn't available by purchasing the magazine in stores. Promo number 20 is Psyduck, and features art from Kagemaru Kimeno. Much like Promo 14 Mewtwo being a reprint of another card just with different artwork, this Psyduck is a reprint of Fossil Set Psyduck just with different artwork. But both cards were illustrated by Kagemaru Himeno, who I previously mentioned as Promo 11 Eevee's illustrator. Back when I was talking about that card, all I said was that I really loved her style, but I didn't even mention how involved in the TCG she is, as she has illustrated quite a lot of cards, easily a few hundred. She's also worked on quite a few Pokemon manga, as well as a few other projects. This Psyduck card was given out at the Pokemon League during September of 2000. Promo cards 21 Moltres, 22 Articuno, and 23 Zapdos feature artwork by Naoko Kimura, who has also done many cards starting during the Neo sets, and his most recent cards being in the XY expansion and was also responsible for one of the Southern Island postcard sets, which are absolutely gorgeous. In North America, the cards were given away with the purchase of a ticket to a showing of Pokemon The Power of One, which I never knew it by that title. I always called it Pokemon 2000, and that's what's on the poster and cover of the movie, so I'm not really sure where the Power of One name comes from, but... Anyway, same deal as the Pokemon the first movie. Buy the ticket, get a card, trade in line. Unfortunately, this time I went with some friends to see the movie, so I didn't have any source of obtaining extra cards, so I never completed this set as a kid. Oh well, at least I got Articuno. Promo card number 24 is Blank's Pikachu, also referred to as both Birthday Pikachu and Happy Birthday Pikachu. Features artwork by Kagamato Himeno, who, again, I previously mentioned in the entries for Meowth, Eevee, and Psyduck. And her art for this card is simply gorgeous, probably my favorite that she's ever done. The colors are vibrant, the posing is phenomenal, the holographic aspect adds flair and dimension in ways that few holographic cards ever utilize. This card is probably my favorite of the entire Wizards of the Coast promo set, and quite possibly the entire Pokemon card game as a whole. Unfortunately, obtaining this card was a bit difficult. From what I've gathered, at the Pokemon League events that I previously discussed, there was a point where they handed out blank Pokemon card templates and participants were tasked with creating their own card. I'm not entirely sure how strict the rules were, or if the card had to represent an original Pokemon or one that you made up, but either way, so long as the card was complete with attacks, retreat costs, and all the fine details that would be on a legitimate card, save for the copyright stuff, I'm sure, you'd submit it to Wizards of the Coast and they'd mail you this card in return. Due to this unique way of obtaining the card, very few people had it, and I personally didn't know anyone who did. Unfortunately, it's also the third most expensive card in the set. What are the other two? Well, we'll get to them shortly, so, um... More on that, please. Next up, promo card number 25 is Flying Pikachu, with artwork provided by Toshinao Aoki, which features his usual cute, simple 2D style that I really love. He's the one who did promo 5 Dragonite. This card was obtained by attending the Pokemon League during August of 2001. The original Japanese version of this card featured an airplane, but for whatever reason was removed from the American release. I originally thought it was removed for, well, the same reason you're all thinking, but as I said, the card was released in August of 2001. So, I suppose that wasn't the reason. Promo card number 26 is Pikachu, commonly referred to as Snap Pikachu, as the image for the card was taken from the Nintendo 64 game Pokemon Snap. As this card is photographed as opposed to illustrated, this card has a photograph credit as opposed to an illustrator credit, given to Kakuji Nomoto, who if my research is anything to go by, is a Japanese actor who also produced many of the Pokemon movies, anime episodes, and video games including Diamond and Pearl and the two GameCube games XD Gale of Darkness and Colosseum. This card was distributed through the Pokemon League during August of 2001. For promo number 27, we've got yet another Pikachu. 
This one, commonly referred to as Bumblebee Pikachu, or Tiger Pikachu, apparently because the angle he's at with the stripes makes him look like a bee, or a tiger with stripes. Uh, sure, I, I guess. This card features artwork by Atsuko Nishida, who I previously mentioned as the designer of Pikachu, as well as various other evolutions and many more Pokemon. The artwork for this card is cute. Nothing special, but I appreciate it. This card was obtained by purchasing a VHS or a DVD copy of Pokemon The Power of One, or, you know, Pokemon 2000. I swear these movies were never advertised with those titles. I remember being at the local movie theater and seeing the poster for 2000 and trying to get a close look at Slowking, Elekid, and the other Gen 2 Pokemon in silhouette, and I don't recall seeing the power of one title anywhere, but anyway, that's that. Promo 28, we've got yet another Pikachu. This one being Surfing Pikachu, of course, illustrated by Toshinao Aoki, who I've, again, previously mentioned. Once again, featuring his simple but charming 2D style. This card was released through the Pokemon League during August of 2001, as a set with those other two that I mentioned, if you noticed, they were all August of 2001. Not a whole lot to say about this one, so on to the next. Promo number 29, we've got Meryl, with artwork provided by Ken Sugimori. The first Gen 2 promo card and Meryl is a fantastic choice. Apart from Ho-Oh, I'd say Meryl became much more popular than he would have in the West, if not for all the Pika Blue rumors. And despite the fact that this Pokemon was now going by the name Meryl, many people still wanted to add it to their collections, as it was still, in design, the same Pokemon that we've been hearing rumors about for all this time leading up to Gold and Silver's release. This one was released kind of strangely, and on the Bulbapedia page for it, it's a bit vague as well, simply stating that it was, quote, given away to visitors at participating stores from December 16th, 2000 to promote the release of Neo Genesis. What stores? Do they mean Wizards of the Coast stores? They did used to exist, so I don't doubt that, but... It could have been one of those deals where card shops, based on how many booster boxes they bought, would obtain promos to give away as they pleased. Such things still happen today, especially with Magic the Gathering, so who knows, I guess documentation on this subject is just not out there. Promo number 30 is Togepi, which is quite fitting. I could see either Togepi or Meryl being the first Gen 2 promo card, though admittedly, Togepi would technically make more sense, since it had been in the anime for quite some time and was always a bit of an enigma during the time before Generation 2's release. Once again, we've got artwork from Ken Sugimori, and as a bit of trivia for you, this was the first card ever released, Japan included, to feature a Gen 2 Pokemon. Although in America, it would be released via the Pokemon League and could be obtained by attending during the month of January 2001. For promo number 31, we've got Cliffa. And once again, we've got more Gen 2 artwork from Ken Sugimori. Unfortunately, there aren't really any facts or interesting things to say about this one, just seemed like a random choice for a promo. This one was available through attending the Pokemon League during February of 2001. Promo 32 is Smeargle, and features artwork by Tomokazu Komoya, who's done quite a lot of other cards throughout the years, and we'll have a few more promo cards coming up as we move along. There isn't really a whole lot to say about this card, but I personally have always found Smeargle to be a really cool Pokemon, and I've always wanted to use him in the games, but if I remember correctly, you don't even come across him in gold or silver until pretty late in the game, where utilizing him would mean having to power level him to catch up to the rest of the team. But maybe next time. This card was obtained by participating in the Pokemon League during March of 2001. Promo 33, we've got Scizor with artwork by Hironobu Yoshida. He came on board with Game Freak during the development of Pokemon Yellow as a graphic designer and Pokemon designer, creating Darkrai, Celebi, Rayquaza, Wobbuffet, and more. A large majority of his contributions to the TCG appear to be Generation 2 Pokemon, although he has contributed to more recent generations as well. This card was obtained by participating in the Pokemon League during June of 2001. 
Promo 34 is Entei, with artwork provided yet again by Ken Sugimori. This card is simply gorgeous, and is, from my research at least, the very first reverse holo card ever released in North America. Uh, unless you count Ancient Mew, but even that's more of a full holo. I'm not really sure if Japan had any reverse holo cards at this point yet, but it appears as though they hadn't. This card was given away with the purchase of a ticket to... Um... Spell of the Unknown Entei. What? What are these titles? I simply knew this as Pokemon the Movie 3. Simple as that. That's what the poster at the theater showed. Maybe even Pokemon the Movie 3 Entei, given the unknown text at the bottom, but Spell of Unknown? And you may be saying, well, maybe that's the Japanese title. But no, the Japanese title is Lord of the Unknown Tower. So I really don't know what this name stuff is all about, but it's not the last time you're going to hear about it. So on to the next. Promo 35, we've got Pichu with art by Ken Sugimori. Similarly to Entei, we've once again got that similar reverse hollow pattern, which is just beautiful. Modern Reverse Hollows are so plain compared to these gorgeous cards. This card was given away at the Pokemon League during April of 2001. Not a whole lot to say about this one besides the usual, so on to the next. Promo 36 is Igglybuff with artwork by Kagemato Himeno, the one who did Birthday Pikachu, Eevee, Meowth, you remember. I'm not sure what it is about the artwork of this card, because it's seemingly very simple, but there's something about it that I just love very much, and I'm not even really an Igglybuff fan, I just really like the colors. They're just very nice. This card was obtained by participating in the Pokemon League during May of 2001, and again, no real interesting facts about this one. Promo 37, Hitmontop, features artwork by Atsuko Nishida, again, the one who created Pikachu. Although she didn't design Hitmontop, it's quite obvious that her general design style has shined through every generation of Pokemon to this day. Even in this instance, Hitmontop totally fits her style, even if it wasn't her who designed him. The artwork is incredibly dynamic, and you can really feel the momentum. This card was given out at the Pokemon League during July of 2001. Promo 38 is Unknown J with artwork provided by Hideki Kazama, who's really only done 8 cards throughout the entire TCG, and I can't seem to find any other information on him. This card was obtained through purchasing a DVD or a VHS copy of Pokemon the Movie 3, and, well, let's be real, it's kind of underwhelming. I guess it could have been a trainer card, you know, that would really be the only way to make it any worse, but like, just an unknown? Even an alternate art of Entei would have been cool, but oh well. Promo 39, we've got Mischievous, with artwork provided by Shinichi Yoshida, who has done quite a few cards since the Rocket set, and seemingly retired after his last card being released in the EX Hidden Legends set that came out back in 2004. Yet again, not really a whole lot to say, this one was given out at the Pokemon League during September of 2001. Promo cards 40 and 41 I'm going to lump together because they're kind of a special case. Here we have the two most expensive promo cards in the entire set, 40 Pokemon Center and 41 Lucky Stadium. Both Lucky Stadium and Pokemon Center's art was provided by Big Mama Tagawa, who only seemed to provide artwork for the TCG during Generation 2. Pokemon Center has identical text to its base set counterpart, only having unique artwork, while Lucky Stadium was a unique card entirely. From what I can tell, both of these cards were only handed out once, on a single day at the New York Pokemon Center's grand opening during November of 2001. Due to this incredibly small window to obtain these cards, they are now incredibly rare, going for hundreds of dollars each, and are the reason why I'll never complete my Black Star promo set. We're going to lump quite a few together again, because the next 8 cards were all released via the Pokemon League throughout 2002. Luckily, they stayed in order this time, so that'll keep things simple. I'll make note of interesting things if necessary, but anyway, let's get on with it. Promo number 42 is Pokemon Tower with artwork by Keiji Kinabuchi. He's the guy who did Promo 1 Pikachu and Promo 7 Jigglypuff. 
This card was given out in January of 2002 through the Pokemon League. Number 43, we've got Machamp with artwork by Tomokazu Komiya, who's done hundreds of cards throughout the TCG. This card was given out in February of 2002, once again, through the Pokemon League. 44 is Magmar with artwork provided once again by Atsuko Nishida, the creator of Pikachu. This card was given out in March of 2002. Promo number 45 is Scyther with artwork by Hironobu Yoshida. I mentioned him a few entries back. He was the one who created Celebi, among others. This card was given out in April of 2002. Promo number 46 is Electabuzz with artwork by Miki Tanaka, who has done cards from Fossil Set up to more recent sets like Crimson Invasion. This card was released in May of 2002, once again, Pokemon League. Promo number 47 is Mew with artwork by Ken Sugimori, released in June of 2002 through the Pokemon League. Promo number 48 is Articuno with artwork by Atsuko Nishida again. This card was released in July of 2002 through the Pokemon League. Lastly, for this bunch, we've got 49 Snorlax with artwork by Craig Turvey, who was the winner of the 2002 Wizards of the Coast Pokemon Illustration Contest. This contest apparently had no relation to the event that rewarded participants with the birthday Pikachu promo. Pretty cool that this was handed out as a promo, being given away in August of 2002 via the Pokemon League. Alright, after that whole bunch right there, we've got four left. Let's do this. Promo number 50, we've got Celebi with artwork by Hajime Kusajima, who has done hundreds of cards for the TCG, but only this one for the Wizards of the Coast promo set. Off topic, but he also did graphics for the PSP game The Promise of Haruhi Suzumiya, and I'm just a huge Haruhi fan, so I thought that was cool. This card was given out with the purchase of a ticket to... Celebi the Voice of the Forest, which I remember as Pokemon Forever, which is a much better title. Even the card itself has the Forever logo, so I have no idea where these weird longer names keep coming from, and... In case, once again, you're wondering, no, that's not the Japanese title. The Japanese title is Celebi, A Timeless Encounter. Besides, putting the number in the title and having it work with the name is always the best solution. Shrek took a lot from Pokemon. Promo cards numbers 51 and 52 are Rapidash and Ho-Oh, both cards featuring artwork by Mitsuhiro Arita, who is responsible for over 500 cards in the TCG. Both of these cards were handed out in two ways. One way was by going to the Pokemon Center store in New York, and it features a special Pokemon Center stamp at the bottom right of the Pokemon's picture. And the other way was in the November 2002 issue of Nintendo Power Magazine. They were apparently available all throughout the month of November, so long as you went to the Pokemon Center store in New York, while supplies last of course, you were able to get the cards. Luckily, these cards were a lot more easy to obtain compared to Pokemon Center and Lucky Stadium. It appears as if these cards are a lot more rare than the ones that don't have the stamps that were found in the Nintendo Power magazine. For the last of the promos, we've got promo 53, Suicune, with artwork once again by Atsuka Nishida. This card was packed in with DVD and VHS copies of Pokemon Forever, and really, there isn't much to say about it and that feels kind of anticlimactic, so I'm going to throw in a bonus that many people consider to be part of the promo set. It technically isn't, as it's not numbered, but I'm going to include it anyway just to give us one more to go off on. Promo number 54, not really a promo, Ancient Mew is an unnumbered promo card and was available with the purchase of a ticket for Pokemon 2000 but only during the first week. As I mentioned during the entries, you could obtain Articuno, Zapdos, or Moltres from buying a ticket to the movie. But if you did so within the first week, you'd also obtain the secret Ancient Mew card, as seen in the movie itself. The card does in fact have all the information to make it a playable card complete with attack, cost, retreat, and all the other necessary information to make it usable, Though it's not legal in tournaments, very recently it seemed as though a lot of people thought this card was particularly valuable, but nope, not really. It's just a cool piece of Pokemon history. And that was the complete history of the Pokemon Wizards of the Coast promo set. This was actually a remake of a video I had on this channel years ago that was much poorer quality. 
As I mentioned in the Pokemon Iceberg video, I was going to be moving after completing that. I've finally gotten comfortable after moving, and this video was made as a bit of a test for my new location and equipment. So it's much shorter than my usual offerings, the content is clearly not iceberg related, and I don't expect it to do nearly as well as those videos have. Just consider it as a special to tie you over for the next one. I'm considering going back to Zelda, and this time doing a full franchise iceberg as opposed to just Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask like I did last time. Through you, that's right, you, watching this video right this second, I was able to get a new, much nicer microphone specifically to increase the quality of my audio and make the experience nicer for you, so I really hope that it comes through in this video. I really hope that in the end it's not just my horrible audio editing that's making it sound bad, so please let me know if the quality is higher. Throughout the move, I had much less time to work on videos, respond to comments, and all that, but now I should be back on track to making videos more consistently. Also, please let me know if you're all okay with me going off and making random topic videos like this one, alongside the occasional iceberg. I really love just talking my mind about things, and have even considered doing more editorial style videos where I simply discuss topics. I had an idea planned for a Halloween themed video that was going to discuss horror in different aspects, but I'm not quite sure if I'm going to have time to do it now, but if you're anything like me, Halloween seeps into early November too, so maybe I can still do it if I have time and just release it late. Also, sometime between my last video and this one, I managed to cross the 10,000 subscriber line and really, you are all too much. Thank you so much for the massive milestone. Even crossing 500 was a massive achievement, so this has long surpassed anything I could have ever thought it would become, so really, thank you. It's, it's quite wild to me. Uh, thanks, I, I can't say that enough. Anyway, thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you have a swell day.